Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing discussion of American cultural history. In the previous lecture, we talked about television in the 1960s. And in this lecture, we pick up that story. We'll continue talking about television, bringing in one of the most popular forms of programming on television in the decade, sports. As we discussed in a previous lecture, athletics on television seemed to be a natural fit. Sports were inexpensive and uncomplicated compared to shooting a scripted show. They created a sort of reality television before that was a phrase anyone would have understood. Boxing and wrestling were particularly profitable in the 1940s and 50s on television. In the early 1960s, ABC was in third place by a mile among the big three television stations. They began adding more sports programming to compete with the other networks. In 1960, Rune P. Arledge joined ABC to handle football coverage. He revolutionized television and the game. He wanted to take the viewer to the game and provide excitement. In 1961, Arledge started the wide world of sports that took ABC cameras all over the globe to all kinds of athletic contests. Wrestling, skiing, log rolling, demolition derbies, just about anything. Arledge believed that sports was entertainment. He added personal stories and camera shots of the stands. As he said, very few men have ever switched channels when a nicely proportioned girl was leaping in the air. He added what he called honey shots of attractive women in the stands. Television made sports truly national, and teams could win fans far beyond their local fan base. The Dallas Cowboys marketed themselves as America's team, and the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders became nationally known. As television coverage improved, adding replays, slow motion, and different camera angles. And as televisions themselves improved, more and more Americans began to say they would prefer to watch a game at home than attend live. In 1970, Rune Arledge introduced Monday Night Football, now the longest running primetime program on television. This injected a live sporting event into the regular workweek programming Monday Night Football, with its original broadcasting crew of Howard Cosell, Keith Jackson, and former Cowboys quarterback Don Meredith, was a huge hit and routinely ranked among the most viewed programs every week. In the decades since, the NFL has added games on Thursday night, along with occasional games almost every other night of the week, and Monday Night Football remains one of the biggest draws on the television schedule every time it airs. Television also helped to revolutionize the sport of football itself. In 1960, two Texas millionaires named Lamar Hunt and K.S. Bud Adams formed a rival football league of eight teams, the American Football League, when the National Football League failed to grant them franchises. For several years, the two leagues battled for television rights among the big three networks. The NFL contract was won by CBS. The AFL contract, won initially by ABC, was won in 1964 by NBC, which in frustration over having no football contract, offered a huge $42 million contract to the fledgling league. With the money, AFL teams were able to sign more legitimate players. Most famously, in 1965, the New York Jets signed Alabama star quarterback Joe Namath to the largest contract ever, $420,000 for three years. The AFL also revolutionized the game. They were more willing to sign black players. By the mid-1960s, the Kansas City Chiefs became the first pro sports franchise with more than half black players. In 1964, black players boycotted the AFL All-Star Game in New Orleans due to the racism in that city. The game was moved to Houston, and political leaders in New Orleans moved to improve race relations. They also played a more exciting brand of football. The game was more wide open, with much more passing. They encouraged end zone dances and spiking the football. 
In 1967, a group of millionaires attempted the same type of maneuver in professional basketball, founding the American Basketball Association. The ABA attempted to challenge the NBA, which was thoroughly established and, some thought, boring. The ABA introduced a red, white, and blue ball, a three-point shot, and a slam dunk competition. The ABA was able to sign many young black players. Most noteworthy of them was Julius Irving, nicknamed Dr. J, who rejected the boring style of play in the NBA. Perhaps the ultimate symbol of black sport in the 1960s was Muhammad Ali. Ali, at that time known as Cassius Clay, won the gold medal in boxing at the 1960 Rome Olympics. At the time, he was a young, cheerful, patriotic young man. He slept with his Olympic medal on. Then, after returning to Louisville, several incidents changed him. One restaurant in Louisville refused to serve him. In another incident, he was chased by a white motorcycle gang. As the story ha has it, he was so disillusioned that he threw his gold medal into the river and began to change his demeanor. He became brash, rebellious, and angry. In 1964, he joined the Nation of Islam and changed his name to Muhammad Ali. And in 1966, he refused induction into the military. Such actions made him a hero with black Americans, but hated by many white Americans. After refusing his induction into the military, he was stripped of his boxing title and his boxing license. He was found guilty of draft evasion, a conviction later overturned on a technicality in 1971, but he still was not allowed to box for nearly three years in the prime of his career. Ali was symbolic of the growing, simmering discontent in athletics in the 1960s and the growing militarism of many black athletes. In the turmoil of the 1960s, sport itself was becoming more politicized. In 1966, for instance, the college basketball championship game pitted the number one ranked all-white University of Kentucky team, coached by Adolph Rupp, against Texas Western College, featuring an all-black starting five. Texas Western won 72-65. to 65. Despite milestone moments like that, many black athletes continued to simmer in discontent. Their complaints were many and legitimate. They were hired guns for the white establishment. They lived lonely lives on virtually all white campuses. Opportunities for them were often limited after graduation. They were often put into cupcake classes and not treated equally in the classroom. Such discontent led to the so-called revolt of the black athlete in the late 1960s, and in particular, the movement to boycott the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City. The raised fists of American Olympic athletes Tommy Smith and John Carlos at those Mexico City Olympics remain one of the most iconic, iconic images of those Olympics and in fact of the entire decade. Smith and Carlos were among the angriest of a group of black athletes that had undertaken a series of protests and athletic events and on college campuses beginning the previous fall. Their organization, the Olympic Project for Human Rights, achieved its greatest notoriety during the summer when black American athletes joined the international boycott movement opposing the entry of South Africa into the Olympics. After South Africa was banned again, the international boycott movement died out, but the black American athletes carried on their movement, extending the protest now to the white-dominated athletic establishment in the country and racism on the whole. The boycott movement found many supporters among black athletes, but others felt the sacrifice was too great and refused to agree to boycott. In the end, the athletes called off their boycott, but agreed that each individual might stage some sort of protest at the games. That set the stage for Smith and Carlos. Their protest came on the third day of the games, after Smith had won the 200-meter sprint in world record time with Carlos finishing third. 
Between the end of the race and the medal ceremony, the two made hasty arrangements for their protest. When the national anthem began, the two bowed their heads and thrust their gloved fists skyward. The protest was simple, quiet, and peaceful. Yet a thunderstorm of attacks followed. Smith and Carlos were dismissed from the American team and ordered out of the Olympic Village. They returned to the United States, where both of them confronted decades of struggles in their personal and professional lives. But in 1968, Smith and Carlos struck a chord around the country. An Olympics that saw American athletes on the whole dominate the athletic competition was better remembered for their protest, calling attention to racism in the United States. Their protest came as the civil rights movement reached an important crossroads, coming only a few months after the assassination of Martin Luther King. Black protest had grown increasingly confrontational, with its target being not so much the law of the land as the lingering racism within the hearts of many white Americans. The decades following saw many important advances in race relations with the end of segregated schooling, the implementation of affirmative action, and fairer practices in the hiring and firing of minorities. And yet, as we see even today, their protest has become a lightning rod for many athletes in the contemporary setting who use similar protest to continue to protest against mistreatment and unfair practices many decades later. In our next lecture, we'll talk about another of the cultural touchstones of the 1960s, rock and roll music. Mm -hmm.